Now, I come now to the point in which uh, my talk on the psychology rights touches on my advertised subject, the subject of uh, mul uh, psychology of multiculturalism. Rights, having first encouraged a kind of egotistical individualism in the population, individualism without much individuality, I must, I must say, are now widely believed also to inhere in or belong to groups, so long as those groups are perceived to be in some way handicapped, oppressed, or victimized uh, now or at some time in the past. Not only individuals, but groups then are believed uh, to have rights. Again, these rights often conflict, but this is all to the advantage of a bureaucratic apparatus of adjudicators. Among the group rights claimed in practice by the leaders of groups, who are themselves almost always self-appointed, is the right not to be offended, which of course includes the right to decide what is offensive. There is no need for an objective correlative. Uh, you are offended, of course, if you say you are. But just as the appetite grows with eating, so does taking offense increase with having taken previous offense. And since taking offense gives one the right to, to, to decree what may or may not be said, being offended actually becomes an exercise in power. Incidentally, the politicization of supposed group rights increasingly puts social pressure on individuals who belong to that group to accept, adopt, or at least not demur from the supposed collective opinion of that group. It goes without saying that the more groups that claim the right not to be offended on the grounds that either in the past or the present they have been persecuted or maltreated, the narrower and narrower the range of opinion that can be expressed which groups are to be protected from offense becomes itself a matter of conflict. But the fact is that the majority of the population by now belongs to one minority or another that claims the right to decide what is offensive. An atmosphere not exactly of terror, that would be a, a bit of an exaggeration, but at least a fear and anxiety that I think is now general has resulted. People are afraid to speak their mind. An analytic colleague of mine in an American publication for which I write, and who herself always writes in a measured way and never expresses an opinion that is absurd or indefensible, has now to live under police protection because she has published work that offends certain groups. Not long ago, the Irish a television service asked me to give my opinion on the sudden rise in the Western world of the question of transsexualism, uh, now incidentally called transgenderism, a change of vocabulary which I find significant and far from innocent. The producers of the program wanted to find someone to say that the rise uh, to prominence of this question or problem was something other than a great social advance and it was not a great uh, advance for the freedom of mankind. But they were having great difficulty, not with finding anyone who was of that opinion, but finding anyone who was willing to express that opinion in public. In other words, a very small group had managed within a matter of a few years, I don't know when this question first came to prominence, it's a bit difficult to say, but it was certainly not more than five years ago, uh, it, it, this group has managed to prohibit debate on a subject that is, at the very least, debatable, doing so by claiming the right not to be offended. In no time at all, practically, their right has enabled them and their supporters to impose what is a very strange uh, view on the world that only a tiny minority of the population has. In a Dutch university recently, where I gave a talk, uh, there were um, notices on the lavatories enjoining users not to embarrass transsexuals, claiming that we can do better. And debate has been so effectively silenced 
uh, that there is no debate even in medical circles. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, published in 2013, gave the prevalence of transsexualism as about 0.0035% of the population. That is to say, approximately one person in 30,000. Five years later, uh, so four years later, I apologize, in 2017, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine gave the prevalence as 0.6%. That is to say, an increase in only four years of 17,000%. Um, what was, I found most significant about this was that it passed without notice or commentary. And to, even to have commented on it, or, or to have noticed it, would have caused offense. And, uh, and people are afraid. Increasingly, groups or their supposed leaders claim the right to be represented in demographic proportion um, in the more prestigious or lucrative positions in society. As far as I know, no pressure group has ever been formed for the right to sweep the roads. If all groups are not represented um, proportionately, in the higher reaches of society, there can be only one explanation of it, that is to say discrimination. And to discriminate is an attack on the rights of the discriminated against, and can only be repelled by a resort, uh, can only be altered or improved by a resort to a vast political, legal, and administrative apparatus to ensure that supposed justice is done. And I. I'm not sure whether I told you about this some years ago, one year ago, two years ago, but in the hospital in which I worked, they sent a questionnaire to the employees asking them to state their sexual orientation. Now, there were only six choices. <laughs> and I said that really they ought to, uh, this shows a very limited um, uh, sexual imagination and that they ought to read uh, Kraft Ebbing and uh, Psychopathia Sexualis um, and races I think there were 17 races uh, they omitted the Melanesians and um, and religions there were quite a few but all together and the, the reason for this uh, inquiry was so that they could uh, pay us uh, correctly that is to say proportionately to the proportion of people in the various categories. Well, whatever one might think of the doctrine of human uh, rights, I think it fair to say it was intended to, uh, to expand the scope of human freedom, and, in, in, and actually did so. But in our hands, I mean in the hands of the intellectuals of our time, the doctrine of rights has been uh, increasingly used to assume power and uh, limit freedom. So in summary, I would say that the notion of rights has the following effects. It increases egotism and an insensate individualism. It increases self-esteem at the expense of self-respect. People have a right to self-esteem. It promotes a psychological dialectic between resentment and ingratitude since what is received as of right is not appreciated since it is received as of right, and what is actually received is actually usually uh, less than, the than what people are, think that they are entitled to, thus becoming a cause of resentment. It induces a permanent state of querulous vigilance insofar as it is, it feared, it is feared that one's rights uh, are being constantly infringed. It causes perpetual conflict between different people's rights that are not compatible, an incompatibility uh, that can only be resolved either by legal action, that's in the best of cases, or in some cases, violence. And insofar as rights are uh, inalienable, 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 they trump, uh, if I may use that word, <laughs> all other moral considerations. 
and uh, while promoting personal egotism, they also promote uh, group rights, which entails the balkanization of society and the promotion of the idea that the division of the spoils is the main aim of political and economic uh, life. The slices and crumbs of the economic cake uh, to be assigned according to some abstract but self-interested uh, plan. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, the consequences of the notion of rights uh, uh, for human freedom uh, are, are therefore obvious. Thank you very much.